And his days were spent swimming, playing touch football on the beach, building sand castles, fishing with our dad, riding our bikes all over Seven Mile Island, and, and just hanging out with the cousins. On rainy days, we play endless games of monopoly. So, we, that's usually what we're going to do, we, um, Mom would also take us to some uh, what were called junk shops on the mainland in New Jersey, which are now called antique shops and everything costs more. <laughs> Our stone harbor house had neither a TV nor a phone. But one summer something happened. Martina began to cry at night, and really not to cry, but she moaned in pain. My oldest sister described it as howling like a wolf. She told us her arms hurt. So mom would give her aspirin, dad would run a thing getting on her arms, and would read us stories, because we always shared them when we were growing up. But the pain persisted. After emergency room visits and doctor visits, and even after one doctor told my parents that Martina was just looking for attention. Of course, my parents knew something was very wrong. And that fall, dad made an appointment for her to see a pediatric neurologist at Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. By that time, Martina had lost all use of her arms and her hands. She was in the third grade. She was hospitalized in New York City and underwent tests after tests and had physical therapy to prevent her arms from atrophy. The doctors even put her arms in casts, these big, heavy plaster casts. The diagnosis eventually was neuritis, an inflammation of the nerves. The nerve is infected with a virus and the virus dies slowly as the nerve travels down from the shoulder blade to the wrist. Imagine a white hot metal wire being threaded down your arm from the shoulder blade to the wrist. I've suffered about a bit, two bouts of neuritis in my 20s. Our grandmother suffered it. My son had neuritis at the same age Martina had. I mention all this because she was in terrible pain and nobody knew what she was going through. Nobody could see anything wrong. Um, and I never really knew what she suffered until I was in my 20s, and I, I came down with the rights too. When she was in the hospital, and it, when I was, I was so little, I used to think back then, and she'd been in the hospital for a year, and it was probably a month. But our parents could visit every night, and Mary and I only got to visit her once. And that was after special permission from the doctors. Um, so there she was in pain, unable to use her hands, and not knowing if she'd ever be able to use her hands or her arms. But luckily, because she was young when she had her neuritis, she did regain nerve function. And I remember the first Christmas post-neuritis. Now, she got out of the hospital, but the doctor said, you got to wear the cast so your, your arms don't grow wrong. Which they wouldn't do nowadays. It was probably the wrong thing to do, but so we're all dressed up in our Christmas best, and she's got the, the cast on her arms. And we went to our Carol cousins, who we were very close with. There were five of them, three to be six, three of us, and the four adults. So we made a pretty raucous bunch. The cousins were mostly boys, we were all girls. So the visits always started out with the boy cousins chasing the girls around the house. And the game usually became, get more, they would grab my stuffed animal, and the game became Martina and I would try to get the part of the stuffed animal back. Well, this time, Martina had a weapon. Her cast. <laughs> and boy, did she use them as a weapon. And I got my stuffed animal back, and they never chased up around the house again. <laughs> and Rob Patton and Tom quickly gave her the nickname, Plaster Arms. But she wore like, like a bad dog. My stuffed animals were safe. My big sister was looking out for me. This overcoming of a painful situation for neuritis and turning it into a strategic advantage says a lot about the person Martina became. She loved her work at Stavros and the people she got to know through her advocacy for the differently able. Martina believed in fairness and justice. And her father had a big influence on that while we were growing up. All three of us heard the story many times of when our dad was in the army in World War II. He was on a troop train from Plattsburgh, New York, to Georgia. When the train crossed the Mason-Dixon line, it stopped, and all the black soldiers were told they needed to go to the rear car. 
Before he gets finished, he's going to take the car. Or take the car. Mason Dixon line actually plays a part in our family history. As Martina and I learned a few years ago, turns out our great, great, great grandfather, who had a farm in southern Chester County, Pennsylvania, two miles from the Mason Dixon line, was lynched by a pro slavery mob two years before the Civil War. He had gone to Baltimore to free a young black woman who he employed with a employed on his farm, and she was not a slave, she was a free woman, a free American, and because he like, gave her freedom, the pro-slavery forces decided to leave him by women. Learning his family history has a profound influence on our community. Just as we brought up hearing the story about the black soldiers on the troop train from our fathers, we found out that the sense of justice and fairness goes back pretty far from collective family strength. Maybe it's even genetic. I know it wasn't fair that Martina died when she did. She had a lot more work, a lot more living to do. And it broke my heart that I couldn't be there when she passed. I remember the morning after she died. I was in my car. It's early morning. I was traveling on a highway overpass, so there was no greenery or anywhere. It was just concrete and asphalt. But out of the corner of my eye, I caught a little bird flying, and it started to drop. And then I could see it. It suddenly remembered that it didn't have to fly, that it had wings now. And it took off way out of sight. It soared out of sight. And I knew in that instant that Martina was okay, and that she was just getting used to her non-physical form. I still miss her every day, even though we lived hundreds of miles apart. We emailed quite a bit, and she she was always looking after me. She listened to all my rants and bitching. And she'd always say, well, it's just a job, or it's just this, or it's just that. So I miss her every day, and I want to thank all of you for being here today. And that's all I have.
shared an office with Martina and she is a big hole there right now. Uh, I, every time I'd come in she was busy checking the messages and the, the daily news and uh, it was becoming comical her size of exasperation daily injustices and shallow minds that were permeating our world. But um, she always maintained a sense of humor, a sense of hope, and, uh, and a strong vision for, for fighting for a better future and, and a true, true respect for the salt of the earth. Um, when Mike suggested this poem by Marge Piercy to be of use, um, it was so absolutely appropriate. Um, I'm honored to read it, and here goes. The people I love the best jump into work head first without dallying in the shallows and swim off with sure strokes, almost out of sight. They seem to become natives of, this, of the element, their black, sleek heads of seals bouncing like half-submerged balls, um, <laughs> half-submerged balls. I love people who harness themselves and ox to a heavy cart, who pull like the water buffalo with massive patience, who strain in the mud and the muck to move things forward, who do what needs to be done again and again. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along, who stand in line and haul their places, who are not harbor generals and field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire be put out. The work of the world is common as mud, botched, it smears the hands, crumbles to dust, but the thing worth doing well done has a shape that, that satisfies, clean and evident. Great amphoras for minor oil, Hopi vases that held corn are put in museums, but you know they were made to be used. The pitcher cries for water to carry as a person for work. That, that is real. And that's what Martina through and through. And, and the world absolutely has been a better place for her in it. And I miss her dearly. My name is Linda Hickman, and I considered Martina when I was with my best friend for over 20 years. And uh, when I first met 
poor Dina, I couldn't believe her energy, her drive. At that point, she was riding bicycles, and she was riding 30, 50 miles at a time, and she broke her arm, and I'll never forget her begging the doctor, please, please, when can I ride again? When can I ride again? That was Martina, just always wanting to get right back into the saddle. So, um, Martina and I both loved to exercise and to socialize at the same time, so we would um, go for dog walks very often and let our dogs play while we got to talk. I was asked to do a memorial reading, and I came up with uh, several short ones, which I will read. The first one, the author is not known. It was originally not how did he die, but how did he live, uh, but this is the female version. Not how did she die, but how did she live? Not what did she gain, but what did she give? These are the units to measure the worth of a woman's achievements, regardless of birth. Not what was her church, nor what was her creed, but had she befriended those really in need? Was she ever ready with word of good cheer to bring back a smile, to vanish a cheer, to bring, nor, nor did, okay, sorry. nor what did the sketch of the newspaper say, but how many were sorry when she passed away? The next is, as we look back. As we look back over time, we find ourselves wondering, did we remember to thank you enough for all you have done for us? For all the times you were by our sides to help and support us, to celebrate our successes, to understand our problems, and accept our defeats, or for teaching us, by your example, the value of hard work, good judgment, courage, and integrity. We wonder if we ever thanked you for the sacrifices you made to let us know, uh, to let us have the very best, and for the simple things like laughter, smiles, and times we share. If we have forgotten to show our gratitude enough for all the things you did, we're thinking we're thanking you now, and we are hoping you knew all along how much you meant to us. Thank you.
Jesus. Her 
freed Hodica, who led an actual rebellion against the Roman emperors in the east of England in the first century AD. She organized her tribe and all the neighboring ones to rise up against the increasingly oppressive Roman reign. And they had won back their region and had sacked Londinium before being turned around. How different might history have been if they fully succeeded in pushing the Romans out? Such a warrior was Martina. She suffered greatly with great forbearance. The physical pain her maladies caused her, but she would not suffer injustice against others under any circumstance. She didn't sit by and complain. She took the fight to every challenge. At the same time, she seemed to be able to find the humor in almost any situation. That's also an ancient martial art, the heart jujitsu. To make something laughable before the depth of your caring about it renders you useless. How many times in these last few depressing years, full of war and austerity, have we all had a day saved by one of those cartoons she linked us to? <laughs> I would dare say that she would find something to laugh about in all of this. And I can surely use that sense of humor right now. The grit and the grin. The grit and the grin, always there at sea. Whether rubber boot deep in goat yard mud or dressed to convince in her lobbying suit, the grit and the grin were her BFFs. And the faith, deep faith in an odd way, that a better world actually is possible that she was going to make sure that that world happened or die trying. To the great loss of us all, it was far too soon to live. Books and libraries. 
which is, makes it perhaps fitting that I ended up becoming a librarian. And she supported me in whatever I did, even if it was a complete acad academic shift from engineering to library science. <laughs> they, both, they both have science in the name, but they're, they are, you, don't, you technically don't need calculus for shelving books. <laughs> That ultimately I could go in and renew her books. It was just a perk for her. <laughs> that being said, I have never met someone happier to pay her overdue library fine than my mom. She knew the phone funds were going to a good cause, one that she supported. Sometimes I'd go and be like, here's some extra money for my fine. Don't give me change because libraries were so important. I knew my mom as the best kind of troublemaker one who put her life into making the world a better place, doing what she could to enable people to live happy, healthy lives. I knew that she was an activist and an agitator, perhaps sometimes a bit like the terriers that she loved, passionate, dedicated, and stubborn. But I didn't realize until the past month or so it was quite how profound her efforts were. She was always my mom, doing what she believed in. You know, I mean, our parents are all, all maybe our heroes, but it's hard to imagine how they, their impact and how they make heroes to people outside of the family. She would point out things that she'd achieved, like the hug for assistance stickers on gas pumps, or tell stories about butting heads with town governments or landlords that would go over their way to not rent their accessible apartments to those who needed them. In the past month, it's come home quite how many lives she's touched, the connections she's made throughout the state on an individual and a governmental level. I've been learning that she chose activism over law school, over about decades spent as a political activist, and how much more she was than just my mom. It's a bit humbling. My mom means the world to me, and what she did means the world to so many others. I'm not ready to say goodbye, and I don't think I ever will be. And that's okay. She was an amazing woman, and I hope I can live, live up to the example that she set. Thank you all for coming.
those of you know, those of you who know that area can certainly attest that it is up to the point. It was like duty for Martina. She had been riding her bike six or seven times that distance over the previous years. As I got to know better, I heard stories about the childhood boys. Of how when she went back to elementary school, she couldn't open the hall of doors. So she would sit down, open the book, and wait for someone to come along. Of course she had something to read. Time wasn't wasted. A couple of weeks ago when we were looking over old photos of her childhood, this one my sisters and I'm not sure what this stood out to me. The faces were so familiar. I'm not sure I remember the haircuts. <laughs> After standing in touch for a few more seconds, I figured something out. Look at their hands. Can you see how to hear this holding hers? photo was taken during that in the life cycle. I had seen the pose hundreds of times, especially when she was cold and living with me. And Martina did not shrink from challenges. She sought new solutions rather than accept defeat. On the farm, we often had to carry and move heavy objects. Well, she couldn't grip things well. If she couldn't put her arm over me, we were fine. She even had a trip to wrestle on the goats. Just get an arm under that barn, and well, she would probably go aboard and lose the security. This indomitable spirit refused her work. Martina didn't need brute strength to tackle the boys. She knew just how to step aside and let them ship themselves up. Under the room for a while. I'll tell you, she never went on boss that nasty floor and flat. <laughs> From a young age, Martina had to deal with doctors who didn't believe her. She, she endured more pain on a daily basis than most of us on the left. She was impatient with the dismissal. She could see through the condescending proceedings offered to shoot her away and write about the cultural tradition of her career. As some of the number of simultaneous medical issues, Martina was often referred to specialists. She developed an insight into the ways these practitioners operated. This is buried on the BS in her, her medical scan artist sensitivity. Too many examiners, too little time with the doctor, hurried and shallow interviews, and a slight of hand left her sense. She still had often and called them prescription bills or medicated bills. She would get exasperated and declare, this is where the real art is. That was long term care. One of her favorite rants was you could go on a cruise around the world less than a year in years. She saw them as the biggest, the biggest lobbying organizations in the state and at the front of a real estate grab of a ministry. She fought to reform, she fought for reform of Medicaid funding, and to see the money free away by state bureaucrats. One position paper she wrote was subtitled, and taking a sub purse and turned it into a salad to me. These experiences led her to fight so hard to help others with complex medical challenges with disabled individuals. She knew their pain. She knew their frustration. But she 